all for uh, coming to our philosophy club event this evening. Um, for this evening, we have a very um, good round of, uh, of panel members, and um, the uh, first of which, so I'm going to go through and introduce them all in speaking order, and then we're going to have them one by one come out and give their presentations. So we have uh, Professor Dan Majors of Chapin College. Uh, Professor Dan Majors was raised in Southern California, graduated magna cum laude um, from graduated magna cum laude from the uh, Master's College with a uh, BA in Biblical Studies with an emphasis in Bible exposition. Um, he's traveled to over 30 countries uh, on service-related projects. Uh, he received a Clear California Teaching Credential from Cal State San Bernardino and taught English for a combined three years at both Coachella Valley and Northwell High School. He has presented at several theological conferences and has been published in a journal for Radical Reformation. Uh, he is a former youth director at the First Congressional Church of Riverside and community organizer with Inland Congressions United for Change. Uh, Dan also uh, founded Hunger Truth, which is a project designed to apply intellectual honesty toward religion, politics, health, and the environment. Uh, he also holds weekly gatherings called Truth Conversations, wherein experts and professionals conversationally share their perspectives and allow participants to dialogue with them about their experience and expertise. Uh, and now, next, we're going to have Professor Dan Mays. for putting on this, uh, this conference or this uh, panel discussion at the philosophy department here. And also my girlfriend, Jamima Galan, for putting together this PowerPoint presentation in the car <laughs> on the way over here um, while we were running over curbs um, in the parking lot. So I'm going to ask you a question. You guys ready to do this? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's do this. If God came to you and asked you to strap explosives to yourself, and blow up the local Starbucks, what would you do? Now the first question, since we're all rational and reasonable people, would be, which local Starbucks? <laughs> <laughs> For those of us here that, are, that despise corporate coffee, of course it's an easy answer, of course we would. So let me restart. If God came to you and solemnly asked you to obliterate a daycare, what would you do? Every semester I ask my students this, and I kid you not, I always have a handful of students, at least two or three, that say they would. And so my next thought is, are there any limits? If you're willing to blow up a daycare, I mean, are there any limits at all? And so I ask them, what if God had a baby, a Down syndrome baby, and he gave you a cat of, a cat of nine tails and told you to whip the baby? What would you do? And again, they would do it. If they believed it was really God, they say they would do it. I used to attend Fuller Seminary, and I would ask Christians this question all of the time. And the first question would be, well, God would never ask me to do such a thing. But then, of course, I remind them of Abraham and Isaac, where God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. <laughs> And many of you will say, well, God stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, which he did. But the point of the story is that God wanted loyal, devoted followers who would do anything for God. In fact, at the point at which he was just about to slam the knife into Isaac's chest, God says, stop. Now I know you fear God. And so God wants loyal devotees willing to do anything. I had a 40-year-old Catholic in one of my world religion classes at Mount San Antonio College who said he would kill his twin sons if God wanted him to. He went home, asked his mother, or sorry, his wife, and she said she would have no problem if God asked them to kill their twin sons. The fact that any of us, I think, would hesitate during this question when I would ask my religious friends, and I was religious at the time as well, the fact that I found hesitation, that people would have to think about the question, like, hmm, what would I do, I think indicates that there's a problem, a serious problem with our ethical foundation. 
It has been said that without deities, good people would be good, evil people would be evil, but it takes deities to get a good person to do an evil thing. This became a reality to me about 10 years ago when in studying the Bible, um, utilizing the grammatical historical method, I came to the conclusion that Jesus wasn't the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, but he was actually a human being claiming to be the Messiah. And because of this understanding of an ancient biblical text, my closest friends decided to refuse, they decided that they were no longer going to talk to me at all. I remember going over to a friend's house, and one of my closest friends, these are my closest friends, and he looked at me and he said, you're no longer welcome here. And I had my Bible in my hand, I didn't know what to do at that point. My closest friends were rejecting me because they believed God wanted them to no longer associate with me because I was a heretic, I was a false prophet, I was a wolf in sheep's clothing, so forth and so on. It was so bad that I had professors at my former um, undergraduate school tell their students that I was worse than a crack dealer because the crack dealer will sell cocaine to kids and they might die physically, but what I was selling people would take them to hell forever. So this is the mentality of some individuals, some religious individuals, I'll grant Brian that point. Um, the school went to the point where I wanted to come to an alumni picnic and they said if I came to campus they would escort me off by security, much like Jason told us if we brought cameras, we'd be escorted <laughs> off by security. Um, this kind of ostracization, exclus exclusion, sectarianism, and bigoted in-group, out-group social organizing stems from one version or another of the divine command theory that Ryan mentioned earlier. This view states that if God says something is moral, it is moral. Conversely, if God says something is immoral, it is immoral. It's simple, it's as simple as that. In this view, regardless of how terrible something looks, the believer can never concede that God did something wrong, for that is simply impossible. Plato addressed this question in a dialogue that he had, um, that he addressed between Socrates and a man named Euthyro. Euthyro's dilemma goes like this. God does, does God command particular actions because they are morally right, or are they morally right because God commands them? If the former is true, then morality exists independent of God, and if the latter, morality becomes arbitrary, merely dependent on the whims of God, whether good or bad. When we say God is good, we are saying God lives up to our understanding of the word good, usually defined as loving, merciful, kind, forgiving, and so forth. When we say Satan is evil, we are saying that he embodies our idea of immorality, defined as something that will cause great harm to us in some way. The fact that we are able to read texts like the Bible and take what we want and leave what we don't shows that we are using something independent of God to judge what is good and not so good in the Bible. Now, deities by themselves are amoral. As Ryan was saying, if it's a good deity, you know, that could be something that's positive. A good and reasonable deity could hypothetically give us moral clarity on issues that we're confused about. However, capricious deities or an evil deity is indifferent to human suffering and could cause moral confusion and harm. So let's examine some of our culture's most popular celebrity deities. First, let's look at the sins of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus, who apparently struggles with moral behavior. Collective punishment. And I'm going to... Use Hitler for a second here. <laughs> this man used collective punishment for the Jews in concentration camps. If he, want, he wanted them, the Jews to remain submissive and fearful, and so if one person did something that was out of line, they would sometimes kill a whole bunch of them, maybe punish a whole uh, 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 someone's fi uh, family members. Essentially, they would use collective punishment, punish a group of people for something that one person does, whether it's in subordination or whether it's just doing something that they don't want them to do in one way or another. Now, according to the biblical text, when the rib woman was persuaded by the talking snake to get the mud man to eat from the wrong tree, God decided to punish all women of all time to a painful childbirth. More so than that, when, an, when, when did animals start eating other animals, according to Christians? The answer, when God decided to punish everyone and everything for thousands of years for this one incident in the garden. So imagine, you were Miss Lamb, chilling with your friend Mr. Lion on a Sunday Sabbath afternoon, munching on grass as usual. 
<laughs> Supposedly it was at this moment when God starts cursing everything that Mr. Lion looks like an unsatisfied vegetarian, lips his chops, and uses canines to make him into lamb chop. How about our good friend Achan? Does anyone remember the story of Achan? Achan was a soldier in Joshua's army, and God promised the Israelites that they would conquer and win in war. But they didn't. They lost. And so Joshua starts wondering, well, why did we lose? Well, eventually Achan con confesses. He says, I know why we lost the war. I stole some booty, and I know I wasn't supposed to, but I stole some for myself, for my own family. I hid it under my tent. So he confesses to this. So the punishment that God had for Achan was that Achan had to die, his wife had to be killed and burned, his kids had to be killed, and his animals had to be killed. You tell me what his goats had to do with Achan's sin. <laughs> Children are not exempt from God's punishment. When a few kids called the prophet Elijah a bald head, God sent two bears to maul 42 children. <laughs> And I thought soap in the mouth was overkill. <laughs> Since Pharaoh wouldn't let the Hebrew people out of Egypt, God decided to send an angel of death to kill every firstborn son of Egypt, including the firstborn sons of the slave girls. As a slave, being a slave isn't bad enough. God had to kill the slaves' kids. Pregnant women are not exempt from God's punishments either. God condemns the Samaritans, telling them that their children will be dashed to the ground, their pregnant women ripped open. Imagine God trying to run as a pro-life candidate with this on his record. <laughs> Slavery. Exodus 21.20. Not only were the Israelites permitted to have slaves, but God says that they, can, he could, they could beat them with rods as long as the slaves got up in a couple days. <laughs> According to Exodus 21.20, God thought it acceptable for fathers to sell their daughters into slavery. Talk about family values. Virgin women. Deuteronomy 22, 20 through 21 justifies stoning women who are not virgins on their wedding nights. So do you know that the method that they used to determine whether the woman was a virgin or not? A cloth. And if the, if the couple could not produce a bloody cloth on their consummation night, the woman could be potentially accused of um, not being a virgin and stoned to death. Animal sacrifice. God required the unnecessary slaughter of millions, if not billions, of helpless Innocent animals as sacrifices. Blood atonement. God in both testaments needs blood to forgive. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. What kind of deity are we talking about here? How are, for, think about this. Forgiveness by definition, by definition, forgiveness is the cancellation of an unpaid debt, not a business transaction. All of this, and we haven't even touched on generational sin, misogyny, patriarchy, scapegoating, male genital mutilation, otherwise known as circumcision, homophobia, or a myriad other cruel and unusual punishment, punishments. Now we can begin to understand why Thomas Paine said it would be more consistent that we called it the word of a demon than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served the corrupt and brutalized mankind. And for my own part, I sincerely detest it, as I detest everything that is cruel. Now let's talk about why Jesus isn't as great of a Christian as we thought. <laughs> Although Jesus was a million times better than most during his day, I'll grant, I think we tend to romanticize him, overlooking his own ethical and cultural limitations. Mark 24 through 30 remembers Jesus is referring to a Gentile woman as a dog, a derogatory term during the day. It was a Syrophoenician woman. She asked Jesus to heal her daughter, which he says, let the, children be, be fed, let the children be fed first. He's referring to the Jews. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, meaning the Gentiles. On some level, Jesus, is mo as most other Jews of his day, saw Gentiles as inferior. Jesus' mission was, let's, let us not forget, first to the Jews. He says, quote, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel in Matthew 15:24. Jesus saw, pigs as one of the mo Jesus saw pigs, one of the most intelligent animals on the planet, as unclean, and is remembered as casting demons into a group of them, which then ran down a cliff into water and drowned. Now, I know you meat eaters don't give a shit, but us vegans and vegetarians do. Really? Did the Prince of Peace really have to drown a herd of innocent, non-human animals? Jesus could have and should have explicitly... Oh, sorry. Um... Why not send, why not send 
the, de the, 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 the demons into a grave? Why not send the pigs into, um, let's see, a dead animal? Why not send the, the pigs into a falafel? Why not? <laughs> Jesus could have and should have explicitly condemned slavery, but he didn't. In fact, his parables assumed the validity of the institution. He is remembered as saying slaves are not greater than their masters, and the Deuteropauline epistles explained slaves obey your masters. Homosexuality, let's be honest, Jesus believed it was wrong because Yahweh said it's an abomination. I can remember in 2004 when Mayor Gavin Newsom started legalizing same-sex marriage in San Francisco as the mayor in, a, in an act of civil disobedience in, uh, in terms of Henry D David Thoreau's tradition. And I was a Christian at the time and I thought, is there something wrong with homosexuality? And I was a Christian, so I believed there was something wrong. I guess I didn't know what it is. So I remember watching Hannity and Combs, and they had James Dobson on. And they, and they were questioning Dobson. He's a Christian uh, psychologist, PhD, um, speaks for the, for the Christian right. And I figured if somebody has an answer for this, because he was claiming that it was going to be the, the beginning of the end for our society. Well, I waited for an answer. I waited for James Dobson to give me some good reason to believe this would be the end of our society. And he couldn't provide one. So really, for one of the first times in my life, I started thinking, well, maybe if he can't provide a good reason why it's wrong, maybe it isn't wrong. Maybe there's nothing we should be scared of. Let's talk about the God of Roman Catholicism. Even though 15 million people have died in Africa from AIDS, that is 6,000 people a day, even though more than 14 million children have lost one or both parents to AIDS, even though 11,000 are infected with HIV every single day, even though more than 88 a percent of all Africans possess HIV, even though 97% of all AIDS-related deaths occurred in Africa in 2007, as recent as March 17, 2009, the Pope condemned the use of condoms in Africa. Way to go. Let's talk about Allah, the God of Islam. He is said to embody compassion. In fact, he is called the most compassionate. Yet there's text in the Quran that says when God punishes the unbelievers. One of the methods he's going to punish them is burn their skins off, put new skins back on, and only to burn their skins off again. If that's not cruel and unusual, <laughs> what is? My friend Richard Miller says that if, if God isn't as kind and as compassionate as our grandmothers, I have no interest in calling it God. Lastly, let's look at deities that offer heaven in another life instead of earth in this one. This can be detrimental to ethics because it can cause us just to accept that we are not going to get what we want out of life now and make us wait until death for fulfillment. Instead of fighting for justice now, peace now, the world we want now on earth, instead we wait, we pray, and passively look forward to heaven. It makes sense that Napoleon Bonaparte would say religion is what keeps the poor from murdering the rich. <laughs> Besides, if God is going to destroy the earth and start all over anyway, what motive is there for taking care of the place? It would be like a home in foreclosure. Who in the right mind would give it a new roof, a new paint job, refurnish the floors, or manicure the landscaping? So do deities make us good? Gregory S. Paul in the Journal of Religion and Society in 2005 systematically compared 17 economically developed nations and reached the conclusion that the higher rates of belief and worship of a creator correlate with higher rates of homicide, juvenile and early mortality, STD infect infection rates, teen pregnancy, and abortion. An extensive study conducted by sociologist Dr. Phil Zuckerman, which Ryan mentioned early, earlier, from Pisser concluded, quote, the most secular countries, those with the highest proportion of atheists and agnostics, are among the most stable, peaceful, free, wealthy, and healthy societies. As the most, as most, um, as the most religious nations, wherein worship of God is in abundance, are among the most unstable, violent, oppressive, poor, and destitute. So if deities are not the best foundation for ethics, what is? I would argue that it's our biology. It's our ability to experience pain and pleasure that's in all of us via the central nervous system. Doing ethics then is evaluating an idea concerning the relative good that is a pleasure or happiness or bad, pain and suffering it will bring to the planet. Speaking of humans, non-human animals, and the environment, not what deities want or command. Richard Dawkins talks about the selfish gene, that all of us 
our DNA makes us, to a certain degree, selfish because we want to survive, we want to live, so we eat, we drink, we, do, we get sleep because our bodies need that. But on the other hand, he talks about, so on the other side of the coin is that we're the altruistic animal. That in order to not only just survive, but thrive, it's good if we cooperate, if we work together, if we share resources, that we help one another. Elizabeth Cady Statton said, the happiest people I have known have been those who gave themselves no concern about their own souls, but did the utmost to mitigate the miseries of others. Humans are not categorically different from other animals in this regard. Primatologist Franz de Waal cites a study in his book, Primates and Philosophers, that shows moral behavior is not exclusive to humans. They did a study with raised monkeys where they trained monkeys to pull a chain in order to get their food. And what they did is they put another monkey, a raised monkey, in a, in, a, in a cage next to this monkey, so every time he pulled his chain to get food, it sent an electrical shock to the other monkey. And so certain monkeys would not eat because they knew, if they, they learned after a while, that if they pull the chain, their friend's going to get shocked. So some monkeys starved themselves, one up to five days, another up to 12 days, because they didn't want to see their fellow monkey get shocked. Although not as dramatic, the same researchers found that rats had the same reluctance to hurt a fellow member of their species. These animals were willing to suffer in order to prevent a stranger from feeling pain. Guy P. Harrison writes in his book, 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in God, which is more likely, that a god blessed these monkeys and rats with the gift of moral awareness? Or that evolution shaped them into social creatures with a strong instinct to care about other members of their species? Non-human animals of the same species tend to care for each other, defend one another, share resources, warn each other of danger, and in general, help each other. Oxford biologist Richard Dawkins says even bees, wasps, ants, termites, rats, and woodpeckers care for our younger siblings. We, more than any other animal, have the ability to extend our moral communities far beyond our own species. It doesn't take anything away from us. In fact, it will only improve our ability to survive and thrive if we extend universal compassion beyond our race, beyond our ethnicity, our nationality, our country, our gender, our sexual orientation, and even species. If we can live happy and healthy lives without causing suffering or death to other sentient beings, then why don't we? We don't need ethics to believe in healthy food, clean air, pure water, quality shelter, or universal health care for every man, woman, and child. So I ask again, what would you do if God asked you to do something you felt ethically questionable? All in all, what is potentially more detrimental to human health and happiness than the various renegade deities examined throughout, mostly because I don't think these deities exist, is that some people are willing to do anything God wants, real or imagined. We need more people willing to say, you know what, God? No, we will not worship devilish gods. We will not abandon our reason. We will not harm other sentient beings. We will not unnecessarily kill animals for food, clothing, or environment. We will stop using condoms, which help stop spreading diseases. We will not harm other people with alternative sexual orientations. We will not permit 1% of Americans to own more than the other 95% collectively. We will not wait for peace, justice, freedom, and happiness in another life. We will struggle for it now, stand up now, and if we can't achieve it, we will die trying.